Mana, Angel Reo, Angel Ro Rangatura, Onge Hoefa, Tenna Koto Kato, Nera Tamihi Motohaki Kiti Kingi to Hetia Potato, Te Ferro Ferro, Te Tua Fitu. Kamihi Hoki, Kia Tato Kato, E Hui Hui, Mai Ne Tene, Ahi Ahipo, No Mai, Piki Mai, Tahuti Mai. Welcome to our Kopapa Kororo this evening. My name is Bryony James. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research here at Tifare Wananga or Waikato. It's my great pleasure to host this evening's session where we're going to explore the University of Waikato's role in pursuing health research and in reimagining healthcare training for New Zealand. Our speakers tonight are Professor Roger Strasser, Dr. Tony O'Brien, Dr. Waikara Moana Waitoki. Dr. Joe Hicks, and Professor Ross Lawrenson. I'll introduce each more fulsomely when they have their turn to speak, and we'll hear from them as they share their own health-related research, as well as a range of perspectives on issues related to regional healthcare. Now, these talks are an opportunity for our researchers to share their interests and their aspirations, and also for our audience to ask whatever questions you feel like. And the way that happens is through Slido. So if you have a smartphone or other smart device, um, we've trained you very well with COVID. We're all very familiar with QR codes now. Well, this one will not only tell the government where you're sitting, it will also allow you to ask a question. Uh, so it'll fire up the Slido app. You can type in whatever question you like, and then they will get beamed by some magical process to my iPad when we get to the Q&A session. So at any point, you can beam in and ask a question. Now, each of our panelists tonight has just 10 minutes, which is hardly any time at all, given the interest of, of what they can talk about. And they're going to give an overview of their particular area, which ranges across, across a wide range of healthcare-related research topics. So, without further ado, uh, you're not here to hear from me, you're here to hear from them. So, I'll introduce Professor Roger Strasser. Professor Strasser is a Professor of Rural Health at Te Huataki Waiora School of Health. Uh, Professor Strasser joined the university in May of this year. It's been an auspicious year for many people. Before that, he was founding dean and CEO of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine in Canada, and he has an international reputation for developing strategies to train healthcare professionals in and for rural communities. Professor Strasser. Thank you. Thank you, Brownie. I'm the one who's the odd one out. I'm not actually going to use slides. I'm just going to talk to you, but thank you for the introduction. And I must say, it's absolutely wonderful to be here in person talking with you, because the previous versions that were planned for this event, I was going to join you by Zoom. So great to, great to be here. Now, uh, for this short talk, I'm drawing inspiration from uh, Albert Einstein. So Einstein defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. My focus is on the health and healthcare of people living in remote and rural communities. So I want you to just stop and think for a minute. Think about over 20% of the population living in remote and rural communities, indigenous people, and the health status of these people is worse than the, than the, the general population, and they have less access to healthcare than the general population. So just think about that. Now I'm betting that as you think about that, you're thinking about New Zealand. And the picture that I painted is true for New Zealand, but it's also true for Canada. So I'm going to start with a story about Canada. Back in 2002, my wife, uh, Professor Sarah Strasser, who's here, she's now the, the Dean of the Te Huataki Waiora School of Health. You want to stand up, Sarah, and take a bow? <laughs> So back in 2002, Sarah and I and our five children moved from Australia to Canada. So we both have a background as rural general practitioners in Australia and found our way into academic medicine. I was the first professor of rural health in Australia. And we moved to Canada, to northern Ontario in Canada, to join people in northern Ontario uh, to establish a new medical school, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, or NOSM. So in 2000, 2001, the people of Northern Ontario, the communities right across Northern Ontario had, had been advocating, had been saying, if we're ever going to have enough doctors and other health professionals, if we're ever going to improve the health of the people of Northern Ontario, we need our own standalone 
Northern Ontario School of Medicine, and the Ontario government actually bought that proposition. So Sarah and I and, and our five kids went over to, to Northern Ontario, to Canada, uh, to join others in establishing, and from what I've said, you can see that the Northern Ontario School of Medicine was established from the beginning with an explicit social accountability mandate. So that's a commitment to be responsive to the health needs of the, of the, the people and the communities of Northern Ontario with a focus on improving the health of the people of Northern Ontario. So we knew from research evidence that the three factors most strongly associated with going into rural practice after education and training are first a rural upbringing, that's having grown up in a rural area. The second factor associated with going into rural practice is, is uh, clinical and educational experiences in the rural setting as part of undergraduate education, so rural clinical experience. And the third factor is after graduation, training that prepares the graduate uh, to, to work as a rural practitioner. So that provided the basis for us to develop the life cycle concept or the, or the facilitated career pathway in Northern Ontario, starting in high schools, actually in Indigenous communities, even in the, in the primary schools, encouraging young people to see a future for themselves that might include health care uh, and motivating them to study, medicine, to, to study in high school and make it to university and into to medicine. Uh, the selection and missions process for Northern Ontario School of Medicine favours applicants from Northern Ontario. And then uh, the, most of the clinical education occurs in the communities of Northern Ontario. Then there's postgraduate training uh, for, the, for general practice and the disciplines in medicine and the continuing education, professional development, graduate studies. So you can see that's the entire life cycle, cradle to grave, shall we say, uh, of a rural practitioner or a, a medical practitioner in Northern Ontario. Distributed, community-engaged learning is the distinctive model of medical education and health research that we developed in Northern Ontario. So distributed, distributed means over 90 sites, nine zero sites, where our students and our trainees and our other learners might undertake part of their clinical learning. So those sites had to be connected electronically, both in real time and asynchronously, and we have an extensive digital library service, which means if you have the internet, you have access to educational resources and information, pretty much the same as if you're in the big city, like in a teaching hospital environment. But the centerpiece of distributed community-engaged learning is community engagement, the active participation of communities in the, uh, the development and the delivery of the education programs. Uh, a, a key feature of, of this program is the principal cl clinical year. This is the year when the medical students make the transition from in classroom learners to clinicians. And in Northern Ontario, the medical students leave the two cities, the university cities, and they go to one of 15 other communities in Northern Ontario, and they live in the community for the whole academic year, and they're based in general practice. So you could say the curriculum walks through the door, like the first patient might be a child, that's pediatrics. The next patient might be pregnant, that's obstetrics. The next patient, might have a, a surgical problem. The learning outcomes for that year in the six core clinical disciplines are just the same as in the other medical schools. But rather than doing block rotations in internal medicine and in surgery and pediatrics in the teaching hospital, the students are learning their core clinical medicine from the community general practice perspective. So this model is known as a longitudinal integrated clerkship and Northern Ontario School of Medicine is the first medical school in the world where all of the students undertake a longitudinal integrated clerkship. This is, as you can see, a real example of immersive, immersive community engaged education. The students are living and learning in the communities where you expect them to, to provide service into the future. This is really learning in context. So, what are the outcomes? Well, it, the school opened officially in 2005, so 15 years later we can say that 92% of the medical students have grown up in Northern Ontario, the other 8% come from remote and rural parts of the rest of Canada. Very different class profile from the other medical schools in Ontario and in, in Canada. Um, we, the, the feedback from the students is very positive about their experience. So, I, I think uh, one example from one of the students uh, uh, it probably sums it up. You don't know it until you live it. You don't know it until you live it. And so, in a way, it's not surprising that 62% of the graduates have chosen to train in general practice, mostly rural general practice. Um, that's almost double the national average for Canada going into general practice. 
33% have chosen other general specialties, general internal medicine, general surgery, pediatrics, which leaves 5% if you're doing the maths in your head. Uh, so that 5% have gone into subspecialties like dermatology, radiation oncology, neurology. And that 5% is important to us in Northern Ontario for two reasons. The first is we need the subspecialists in, to provide care in Northern Ontario. They have to go elsewhere for their training, but they're coming back. But the other is that, that it shows that, that Northern Ontario School of Medicine produces high quality doctors who are competitive to match to these very competitive training programs in the sub specialties. And so that was something that was important to us. As I mentioned, there's training for general practice and other medical uh, specialties in, in Northern Ontario. And if you look at the graduates who did their undergraduate and their postgraduate training in Northern Ontario, 94% of them are practicing in Northern Ontario, 94%. And that includes in the small communities. So talking about the small communities, we did a, a study a few years ago now looking at small communities that before the school came along, they were really struggling to maintain medical services. Uh, they had between them eight communities, they had 30, three zero full-time equivalent vacancies. At the time of the study, they had one vacancy. They had moved from being in crisis mode, trying to fill gaps next week and, and next month, to planning ahead, and they were spending less money on recruitment. And speaking about money, we also have done studies looking at the economic impact of Northern Ontario School of Medicine on Northern Ontario, and have shown that um, there's a, a really substantial return on investment for the government with, uh, with, the, with the school. So to give an example, in 2016, 2017, the budget of the school, that's the taxpayers' money, was $43 million and the level of new economic activity in Northern Ontario was something over $120 million. And this economic benefit flows through uh, to the small communities, not just the larger, larger centres. So this was very important. We also looked at the, at the social impact, and, and there was a sense, really, of, of, of community empowerment, summed up by the phrase, if we can do a successful medical school, we can do anything. So that's Northern Ontario, that's Canada. Let's come back now to New Zealand. And here we are in New Zealand, as I painted the picture before, uh, you know, people living in remote, rural, Māori, Pacific communities, poor, poorer health status, uh, less access to, to health care. There are two medical schools here in New Zealand who are, who are doing the same thing over and over. And they produce excellent doctors comparable with doctors produced by medical schools anywhere in the world. But unfortunately, only about 20% of them choose general practice as their career direction. And very few choose to serve the people living in remote, rural Maori and Pacific communities. In fact, uh, New Zealand is very much dependent on doctors who have trained outside New Zealand, international medical graduates. So just to talk about uh, this year, 2020, of the 161 new general practitioners in, in New Zealand, almost half, 44% are international medical graduates. And there's quite a turnover. So last year, 2019, there were uh, 521 new New Zealand medical graduates and 102 New Zealand medical graduates left practice. We're no longer practicing in New Zealand. Now, some of them were retirements, but many were actually doctors, younger doctors who went to other countries to pursue training and their careers. Uh, so we were left, well, that's 102 is about 20%. So we're left with 100, 419 New Zealand medical graduates. There were comings and goings of international medical graduates as well, which, which was added up to an, a net gain of 313 international medical graduates. So putting all this together in terms of supply of medical workforce, New Zealand has a problem. So what, what's to be done about this? Well, it won't surprise you to hear that the, the solution that I would suggest is a fresh start, is something new and different, is a socially accountable, community-engaged medical school drawing on the experience in Northern Ontario. So just to put this together, the, 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 the Canada and the New Zealand story, and back to Einstein, I'm sure that Albert Einstein would be very pleased to know that the University of Waikato is seeking to establish a new and different medical school that produces doctors who have the skills and the commitment to provide care uh, for the people 
in most in need, people living in remote, rural, Murray and Pacific communities. Thank you. Timing. Thank you, Roger. Our next speaker tonight is Dr. Tony O'Brien, who's Associate Professor of Mental Health Nursing. Dr. O'Brien's had a career in mental health nursing spanning nearly five decades, though you wouldn't think it to look at him. His many research contributions have led to changes in nursing practice, as well as police operational guidelines in mental health emergencies. And this year, he was made an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit in the Queen's Birthday Honours. <laughs> Thanks, Bryony, and um, um, thanks, Roger, for your sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, presentation, and um, great to hear about um, the the model of clinical practice in that final year. And I think that's something that we're going to take forward into our, our nursing program here at Waikato. Um, can I just say thanks to Bryony for organising the evening and for you people all coming along on a bit of a rainy night. Um, I hope you find it's worthwhile. <coughs> um, um, I'm going to um, give you a little bit of an overview of um, um, how we see um, research in the nursing program at the University of Waikato. So the nursing program, as you know, is very new. We've only just got um, approval to run the program. We are planning to start, we are going to start in March next year with our first intake of 40 graduates. So it's a very big thing um, for me. It's a very big thing for the university. It's a very big thing for the region in terms of you know a new nursing program, the first one in New Zealand for 20 years. Um, now, when I say we, the we at the moment, apart from the people at the university who've worked with us to um, get this established, um, uh, myself and Professor Matthew Parsons and um, um, Cheryl Atherfold, Chris Baker at Waikato DHB, we've been the kind of development team over the last year. Our work in the last year has been around developing um, the undergraduate program, postgraduate program, and if I'm quite honest, we really haven't had a chance to say, <clears throat> what about research? How are we going to develop a, a research program and strategy? We've talked about it, and obviously for um, uh, um, a university-based uh, nursing program, especially postgraduate, that has to be underpinned by research, and the, the program has to be staffed by nurses who are active researchers. So it's definitely there on our agenda. Both Matthew and I <clears throat> have um, backgrounds in research, Matthew especially. Um, and um, we'll be bringing that in, but we've got, we've got to kind of work up our model of how we're going to um, develop research within the University of uh, Waikato. So, uh, look, I'll go through my brief presentation here, and um, I like listening to Roger's kind of story about um, <coughs> Northern Ontario, and I'm going to be a little bit indulgent and give you my story about um, research and nursing and how that's brought me to where I am now and where I see that going. Um, is it the middle button, Brian? Some randomly, see what happens. No, not that one. Oh, just <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's that one. Right. There we go. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, uh, what I've done here is I've taken from our curriculum documents and the discussions that I've had with um, um, Chris and Cheryl at the DHB with Matthew some of the underpinning principles that will. Um, support research um, in relation to our nursing program. Um, and they are um, commitment to Tatirati or Waitangi, that's been very strong in our development so far. Um, equity in healthcare, that's a very big part of our nursing program here. We're not here just to do the same thing as other programs are doing. <clears throat> we're here to make a difference, and we want to be held to that as a measure of how well we're doing. We don't want to be measured by just the number of graduates, we do want to be measured by that, but we want to be measured by what difference do we make to healthcare in the Waikato and Midlands region. We know there are inequities in healthcare, we know there are unequal outcomes, we know which populations um, they affect, and we want to make an impact of that through, uh, through this program. Population health is a big focus, um, closely related to equity in healthcare. Consumer engagement, we're not about being experts telling consumers what they need. We want to listen to consumers and help them develop um, solutions to the problems, the health problems they have. Um, 
we want to be engaged with the sector. That's been a big part of how we've developed our program so far. We've been very engaged with both the DHB and the primary care sector around what do they want out of these graduates? What do they want in the nursing workforce? What do they want that's different to what they're currently getting? And we've tried to work hard on um, building that into the design of our curriculum and we'll work hard in <clears throat> building that into the delivery of the program. We're also about um, research that translates into practice. We don't want research that um, just generates outputs. We do want that, obviously, in terms of um, publication. We want to put our work out there, but we want research that will make a difference to what happens in healthcare. Um, so some of the areas we've talked about so far um, are to, are to do um, research that looks at evaluating the nursing programs at, at, at the University of Waikato. So we've got the undergraduate program right through the PhD, and we want to run alongside those programs <coughs> evaluation research that looks at how we're doing, um, educational research that looks at how we're doing it from an educational perspective. Um, <coughs> within our honours and PhD programs, we want to um, um, engage students in research that's aligned to health service priorities, both DHB and primary care priorities, and population priorities too, but we're particularly wanting to engage with the DHB around what their priorities for um, service development and, um, <coughs> and services are. Um, PhD program, um, uh, <coughs> research outputs by publication, that's kind of becoming a given these days. Um, and we also want to contribute to and build interdisciplinary research with our colleagues here at the University of Waikato, who I'm meeting more of every day. And even in terms of the people that um, I'm working most closely with, um, Roger and Sarah in particular in the um, School of Nursing or the School of Health, um, you know, we haven't got to the point yet of looking at how we're going to work in um, interdisciplinary teams, but that's, that's something that's on our agenda. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little a brief outline of um, <clears throat> some of the mental health research that I've particularly um, been involved in so far, and I've identified three areas. Now this doesn't come as a kind of a program that um, I've um, built up. Uh, is anybody tracking the time? How long? <laughs> yeah? How am I doing? You've got another four minutes. Another four minutes, great. Okay. Um, so there's three areas that... Um, um, I've been particularly involved, and they're not the only areas, but they're the areas that um, um, I think have been um, the most important for me. One is um, the physical health of people with mental illness. Some of you will know about the um, <coughs> Equally Well initiative that um, is, is sponsored by TAPO, the National Workforce and Research Centre. And um, within Equally Well, there's been a very big focus on <clears throat> the health inequities um, experienced by people with mental illness. To put it very um, bluntly, people with severe mental illness have a reduced life expectancy of about 20 years. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I won't go into the um, reasons, all the reasons, um, but it's obviously an area where um, health practitioners need to be aware of to make a difference. Um, from a mental health nursing perspective, the area that um, I'm particularly aware of is um, the, the work that mental health nurses can potentially do around helping um, people with mental illness improve their physical health care or their physical health status. And there are things that mental health nurses can do but don't always do what I would like to see happen in our program here is that those um, areas of practice are highlighted so that um, the nurses that we produce will be taking um, that knowledge into their practice. Um, one of the areas there um, is around the side effects of psychotropic medications, um, which contribute to metabolic syndrome, which in turn reduces life expectancy and leads to a much higher incidence of stroke and cardiovascular disease. So there's very clear-cut issues experienced by people with um, mental illness. It's not just severe mental illness, it's also mental illness um, in primary care, depression and other um, mental illnesses that also carry um, worse physical health outcomes. Um, something that's mentioned on the introduction there was um, um, police involvement in mental health emergencies. So a little bit of a story about that. In 2008, um, the police in New Zealand 
um, made the decision to roll out tasers into their um, police um, forces. They had a trial in 2009, I think it was, and at the time, I was involved with the College of Mental Health Nurses. I was the president at the time. <clears throat> and I read in the newspaper that the police were going to um, um, introduce the use of tasers um, in um, frontline policing. And the police identified three um, groups that would be um, the subject of taser use. And one was people in mental health emergencies. And I saw that and I thought, you can't do this, you know, like that is just not the way for police to function. And I thought we, as a, as a professional group, mental health nurses, we can't just sit back and let this happen. So um, uh, <laughs> I did something that I wouldn't do these days. Um, I rang TV3 and said to them, hey, um, I've got something that I want to say to you about that. And... Um, they said, OK, well, we'll organise, um, you know, a camera or whatever. And I said, yeah, OK. And they said, where's, where's your office? And um, within about half an hour or an hour or so, they were there. And, of course, these days, um, uh, you can't bring uh, media into a university just like that. Um, you've got to, it's got to be whatever. Um, so, anyway, that, um, they, they came and they, they ran the story. It was on the news that night and the... Um, 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 on the um, six o'clock news or whatever. And then I wrote a couple of op-eds for the listener in the New Zealand Herald and <clears throat> got myself very unpopular with the police. Um, and I was quite happy to do that because as far as I was concerned, there was a really important point that was being overlooked there. To the police's credit, they really picked up on that. They, and, and I don't claim credit for all of this, but um, they now have a, um, a special unit within the police that looks at mental health response and how they, how they manage that. They take it very seriously. They, they do have their issues around mental health, um, but they've really gone out of their way to kind of um, try and do something about it. They did change their guidelines for the use of tasers to take out that contentious um, statement about mental health emergencies. Um, so I kind of felt as though, you know, that was a good example of advocacy and, um, and kind of making a difference um, by responding to something that was going on. Now, that leads to research, which I'll talk about shortly. The third area that um, um, I'm bringing with me into the university here is around the use of advanced directives in mental health services. A little bit different to advanced care planning, which you may be used to hearing about in relation to end-of-life care and palliative care, that sort of thing. These are... Um, instruments which allow people to state their preferences for health care and mental health <coughs> emergencies when they may be un unable to um, uh, articulate their preferences and expectations at the time. Um, one minute, okay. So this will be really super fast. So I won't actually read these out. I've talked about the main ones. Um, I, I probably, I'll just highlight um, what happened with the um, TASER research. So the police um, published on their website all the case reports of the use of tasers in the rollout year of 2009 or 10. Um, and uh, we captured them off the website and then um, extracted all the data and did some analysis and found that the police, if they brought a taser into um, a, a mental health crisis, they were two and a half times more likely to use it than they were if they brought a taser into a normal criminal um, arrest situation. So there was a very kind of good statistical um, piece of evidence around what the police need to be aware of in terms of what's driving that use of tasers. We didn't think it was um, you know, situational variables like risk or threat. It was more about perception of mental illness. So at least we thought that was quite a um, significant part of of that. One of the other things we looked at a little bit where we couldn't do much, uh, as much analysis of because we didn't have um, good enough data was in terms of ethnicity. There's definitely an issue there as well. So I'm still looking at that issue more generally um, as part of a Marsden group that's looking at um, police um, community response to people in mental distress and um, that's relatively early work yet, it's in its second year, um, but that's ongoing. So look, that's me, um, um, it's, it feels like a little bit of a breathless run through, I hope it's um, useful to you um, and uh, interesting to you. Um, obviously you can um, put questions through the um, app and I'll be happy to discuss those at the end of the presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Tony. I always feel a bit brutish hurrying people along because everybody's so interesting, but then the next person's going to be interesting too, so we just have to keep things moving. Our next speaker is Dr. Waikara Moana Waitoki, who is Senior Lecturer at uh, Tapui Wananga Kiti Ao, the Faculty of Marian Indigenous Studies. Dr. Waitoki is the President of the New Zealand Psychological Society and is a registered clinical psychologist. She's a member of the Payaka Totara, the Māori Psychologist Network, and she's also a member of the Suicide Prevention Office Māori Advisory Group and the Australian Medical Council Aboriginal and Māori Advisory Group. Thank you. Kia ora. My heart started thumping. As soon as she mentioned my name, it was like, dig, dig, dig. Um, kia ora. Thank you for the introduction um, and thank you to the other speakers as well. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ki ngā rangatira o te whare wānanga nei tēnā koutou katoa, ki ngā manuwhiri, manuwhiri e tau toko ana i te kaupapa o te rā, tēnā koutou katoa. He mihi, kou, he mihi ki aku hapū, ki aku iwi ko Ngāti Hako, me Ngāti Mahanga, haere mai, nau mai, haere mai, kuhu mai, kuhu noa mai i ngā huha o rua wehia. Um, kaupapa kōrero. Um, so, I have notes, so if I read and then kind of wander off a bit, but I am timing myself, it, f it turns out that I am short by a couple of minutes, which is kind of good. Um, so in keeping with the kaupapa of the evening, I would like to offer some insights into what I consider, um, not just my own personal opinion, some of it is though, uh, to be the op optimal conditions for developing cutting edge community care. In selecting the research projects I'm involved with, it was a little bit like choosing the player of the day. Uh, each project is valuable for their contributions to health and well-being. however the core features of the projects must be the mātauranga Māori and the collective nature of the teams and the communities of interest. Um, so I'll come back to this picture. This is um, Tongariro uh, Rua Pehu Ngauru Hoi in Pihanga, so this is the central plateau. Um, I was driving through there one day with a group of friends coming back for some research uh, data collection and we were regularly um, doing wellbeing kōrero um, on Facebook Live, and we'd kind of got a bit too tired to do the kōrero, so we sat in the car. On our drive, we decided that we would just kōrero in the car. Um, and so we did this big spiel about keeping well during COVID while we were in the car, and then stopped along the side of the road and took a photo. Um, it's c quite relevant uh, for the kaupapa that I'm bringing today, which is... The f these are the four projects that I've chosen, the embrace of our ancestors, reimagining and recontextualizing Mātauranga Māori and psychology. So it was kind of cool to have this reimagining um, and reconceptualizing in this, this kaupapa. Uh, this image on the left-hand side is an image that my colleague and I developed over the last year and a half, and we've been using it a lot lately. Um, there, it's a well-being image. Um, it's fitsitera, and there are six dimensions of well-being that I'll, I'll talk about. And it's just a really cool picture. I thought it'd be quite nice. Um, so how can... Um, I, I do want to, want to focus on people, and I do want to focus on the shared aspirations that our teams bring to, um, the, to our projects. So how can training, healthcare training benefit from Waikato's world-leading medical research? And I wondered how could I fit into the term medical? I think that health is interrelated, context-informed and environmentally influenced. In this understanding, Mātauranga Māori flourishes and Māori flourish. So I, I offer four projects currently underway that provide core content for healthcare education, research and practice. The first project, Rua Mātiti, Rua Mātata, is unique because it recognises the need to embed Mātauranga Māori into all phases of a research project. I'd like to acknowledge Professor Alan Hogg and all the team members for their commitment to building and sustaining relationships with Māori, having the hard conversations, being willing to be flexible and seeing the potential of each part of the research. 
To understand Māori well-being goes back to the past, to uncover, explore, debate, and cherish those elements of our history that are on the verge of being lost. Well-being requires regeneration and reclamation. Each part of this project is a joy, from finding out about the science of building pā to the reasons particular trees were used and why they were built in the first place. And this means that we have another repository of knowledge that can be added to our understanding, our understandings of well-being. Um, what's really exciting for me, um, and so I'm like a psychologist and why am I doing an archaeology project, um, and it's really because I wanted to impress my son, actually, just <laughs> as simple as that. My son's a scientist and um, I thought I can talk to him about this. And he has come out on a, on a little bit of a, like a shuffle and a dig and a scrape around. And um, he's completely uninterested in the Mātauranga Māori part. Um, and, but the, the beauty of the project is that it really does blend these two knowledge forms, so archaeology, radiocarbon dating, wiggle matching technique, which I'll just say is this incredibly um, amazing technique that does fine tune the, car the, the date of a piece of wood down to plus or minus four years. And so rather than a hundred year time span, which is a couple of generations, we can know that um, the trees were felled at a particular time and we know um, from records who was there, what kind of conversations were happening, what were people doing, and that, that blending and fusion of Mātauranga Māori is, is uh, really important to the project and it's important to Māori and it's important to my understandings of, um, of well-being. Uh, and the fact that we are looking at kōrero and whakapapa, pūrāko, the way that we hold knowledge, the way that we transmit knowledge, uh, is, is something that I'm, I'm really keen to uh, use to inform psychology. So the second project, and possibly my favourite, is um, it's an examination of Mātauranga Māori in relation to well-being and psychology. And so from the very early days of my, this is a story I've told, it's the same song sheet, um, uh, training in psychology is to really be uh, at odds with my Māori cultural identity. And going through training showed me that there was just so much more that we weren't learning, that we weren't being taught, and yet Māori, as we know, are disproportionately affected across all of our health statistics and so when our psychologists go through training they come out and they then incorporate the Māori, the Mātauranga Māori that they either grew up with or that they knew would actually work in some way with their clients and so my question uh, was is what is that knowledge you know when you are trained in a particular way and yet you then go and you learn a whole new set of knowledge or you bring forth that knowledge what is it about that knowledge? And so we're theorising that knowledge um, and the, the goal is to develop our, really, I guess it's to develop our own psychology, if that's even the right word, if psychology is even the right word. And so this is a group of Māori psychologists and students um, and so in reimagining a healthcare model, this is probably the first of its kind uh, weekend Wānanga where we came together and we taught each other uh, Mātauranga Māori in relation to psychology and in relation to well-being. And it was a, a quite an inspiring um, occasion and has then led on to the development of our Māori psychology group. So in thinking about well-being pathways, um, the Six that we have here is language, creative arts, spirituality, genealogy, family, and environment. And so from a systematic review of the literature and co-design, wānanga with Māori colleagues and experts, we came up with this model. Um, and it really looks at the way that we consider what well-being looks like. And so if, um, say I want, and the centre piece is about our modi, so the way that we flourish or our life essence. And so if our life essence is not flourishing, something has caused that to happen. There's an environmental influence there that's happened. And so we're wanting to understand, well, you react to your environment and your environment reacts to you. So we're understanding that relationality. These images we developed during the COVID period 
um, it became really apparent to us that during COVID, uh, pretty much the 25th of March, that there was not enough uh, Māori psychosocial material available to help Māori deal with the pandemic. And so we set about creating some resources and they were focused on these dimensions. And so what I did was I looked at what was happening in social media, um, the news and across the country, how were Māori responding to the COVID pandemic. And across each of the things that I analysed, they either hit language, uh, creative arts, spirituality, wairuatanga, whakapapa, family and environment. And I thought that was really interesting. Uh, these are just some examples of the whakapapa kōrero that we ran, um, really ran them during the second wave. Um, so we ran these three nights a week and we, we being a group of Māori psychologists, half of us were the same ones each time. Maybe we were like repeating, repeating that. Um, and we just talked about some of the topical issues that we felt were relevant for Māori and it was targeted at consumers. Uh, we weren't interested in having conversations with ourselves. So we talked about time and aroha. We talked about rangatahi navigating COVID. We had psychologists in Australia. So we talked about all these, um, what we felt were the core issues for Māori. Oh, geez. Okay. And we did this. <laughs> we did more pictures, developed some models. Um, the, the, I just want to mention this project here, which is our Raranga Raranga. This is our Hapu Ora Māori Wellbeing um, project, which has started, uh, actually started during the COVID period. Again, this is deeply embedded in Mātauranga Māori, and I'm just going to say that in the recent weeks, we've had um, some research that's come out that talks about the way Māori are more, less likely to receive treatment for diabetes, or the way that Māori with gestational diabetes are not given options for, for treatment, and so those are key for us. And then the last one, um, which is about to start, is Wero, working to end racism and oppression. Um, I guess this is really about the way that structural racism inequities for Māori exist and the, the things that need to happen, the change that need to happen to address those issues. I've run out of time. Thanks. So, hold two minutes. Thank you, Dr. Waitoki. I was chatting earlier today to Sonny Collings, who's the CEO of the Health Research Council HRC, and it was quite interesting, actually, because our conversation really touched upon what we're seeing here tonight, which is the whole breadth of what is needed to advance health research in any context, let alone um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And, and so with that in mind, what we're going to see now is, is really swinging to, to the other end of the health research spectrum and the, and the hard out biochemical, biomedical research. So Dr. Joanna Hicks, Dr. Joe Hicks is a senior lecturer in biological sciences. Uh, she works at the interface of biochemistry and infectious disease. Um, I bet you're fun at dinner parties. <laughs> Uh, her research focuses on how bacterial pathogens are able to grow and survive in unique, often inhospitable environments, and critically evade immune host, response, host immune responses. So how might we overcome antibacterial, um, re antibiotic resistance in, in our treatments? This is an incredibly important aspect to health research worldwide. So, Dr. Hicks. <laughs> Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, thank you all for um, being here tonight to, to listen to us talk about um, our research. So we present our research a lot at scientific conferences, but very rarely do we have the opportunity to present it to such a varied audience. So thank you very much for coming along. So as um, my introduction said, I'm a biochemist and a molecular biologist. So I kind of work at the the minuscule end of the scale. So we often refer to what we do as working with small volumes of clear liquids, because what we work with, you cannot see with the naked eye. So we kind of um, are at this, oh, if we go back one, sorry, if we work at kind of the molecular or like atomic level. And so kind of to put that into context, I've kind of shown here, so, um, shown in with the orange wiggly lines is DNA and what DNA kind of looks like. And then around that 
is um, a protein molecule. So this is made up of lots of different atoms, and these are the things that keep our cells going. So everything that is happening in your body at the moment is driven by these molecules that we can't see. So lots of our research is involved in looking at exactly how these kind of protein molecules work um, with a focus on infectious disease. And what we do at this molecular level can be kind of applied to the cellular level, to organ function, to um, the whole body, you know, when we're talking about infectious diseases and different bacterial illnesses, and obviously that has massive effects for our um, family and whānau and our communities as well. So I started off um, here at the University of Waikato in um, doing my PhD, and so my PhD with Professor Vakakis was looking into um, tuberculosis and the ability of tuberculosis to kind of persist inside your lungs. So you can be exposed to tuberculosis, be absolutely fine, don't even know you've been exposed to it, but you've got this tiny little bacteria hiding out inside your lungs that you know, months, years, decades after exposure can flare up and cause um, active TB. So what we were doing was trying to look at these kind of protein molecules within the bacteria to try and see if we could work out what exactly was causing it to kind of hide out in our lungs. And then, um, so post-PhD, I moved to the UK um, for three years and I did um, a postdoc research um, project looking at um, malaria at the University of Cambridge. And we did kind of took the same approach, trying to look at all these different protein molecules that are within the parasite that causes malaria to see if we could find some good targets for anti-malarial drugs. So upon return, to the University of Waikato in um, early 2015. I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to work on and rather serendipitously, I kind of stumbled on this paper about something we've been looking at for a little while and I started doing a little bit of research into the bacteria that causes um, gonorrhea. So this is called Neisseria gonorrhea and it turns out that this is a huge problem. So antibiotic resistance in this bacteria is a global issue and it's also an issue that's becoming very real here in Aotearoa as well. So we've kind of gone from a situation where in the 1930s and the 1940s, in kind of the golden era of antibiotics, we could, you could get a shot of penicillin and gonorrhea would be cured within four hours. But kind of 60 years later, gonorrhea has developed resistance to every single antibiotic that has ever been used for its treatment. And now we're facing what the media is calling um, super gonorrhea, which basically to us means extensively drug-resistant gonorrhea. So people in the UK who have got this kind of superbug require hospitalisation with four to five days on IV antibiotics with some pretty nasty side effects to clear what was once an easily treatable infection. So this kind of, believe it or not, actually made me quite excited. <laughs> I never ever thought I would ever say that. <laughs> but I became really excited about it because I thought this is kind of a real problem that we can actually start to grapple with and work in the lab. So the aim of our research in this project is to determine the molecular details of these key proteins. So you can kind of think of them as like molecular machines in the cell because if we know what they look like in three dimensions, as shown up here, we can design chemicals to bind into them and kind of jam them up and stop them from working. And if some of these molecules are absolutely essential for the bacteria to grow and survive and infect human cells, if we can design something to kind of stick in there and stop it from working, we potentially have a new um, antibiotic. So we can, we can take this approach to determine the molecular details and design and screen chemicals to bind in these molecules. And then we can take these actually into the laboratory and use them to screen against um, the gonorrhea bacteria and to see if it kills the bacteria. And we can also test the ability to affect, infect human cells as well. So shown in purple down the bottom there is a human cell in three dimensions and the little um, red blobs on it are the um, bacteria that causes gonorrhea, and they're stuck to the outside of that human cell about to invade and infect it. And you can see on the other picture there, you can imagine if you take like a ball, 
and cut it in half in the middle. What you're looking at is you've got the human cell around the outside, and all those purple dots in the cell are the bacteria that's infected the cell. So even if we find some compounds or some chemicals that kind of stop these enzymes from working, so if we find something that, say, for example, doesn't necessarily kill the bacteria, but if we can prevent it infecting human cells, this is a pretty good um, option as well. So I kind of wanted to put this into this, into this wider context of how, um, because we're talking about community kind of healthcare, and I work, and how my work at that kind of molecular level can actually help to contribute to addressing sexual health inequities and hopefully better health outcomes. So I kind of made this kind of continuum. And so I think that to address sexual health inequities, it's a collective effect. So we need fundamental research into those, into sexually transmitted infections. And the sort of research that we're doing, um, so we're looking at other projects that look at non-symptomatic infection. So certain people with gonorrhea might show no symptoms, but they can still transmit the disease to other people, which means, you know, which is a major factor in driving infection. And um, we, we need new antibiotics. I hope I've got that, um, that point across today. And we also need vaccines as well. So vaccines are really good preventatives for the spread of disease, and we've got anti but we need those vaccines to kind of keep our antibiotics that are useful to remain useful. And then we also need kind of to, we need more um, sexual health research as well. So research into what's driving sexually transmitted infections, how they're transmitted through the community. Is there, you know, the quality of sexual health services across Aotearoa? And this relies on sexual health services, GPs, and Maori and Pacific sexual um, health services as well. And if we combine all of these things and a whole lot more, we can actually go about kind of getting some policy change to kind of start addressing these inequities that we see in sexual health across Aotearoa. And in that, um, in that vein, one of the other projects that we kind of like to, um, to start establishing is using um, gonorrhea genomics and epidemiology to actually trace um, gonorrhea infection. So the prime example of this is COVID-19. So at the moment, they're using whole genome sequencing to identify you know, where people have, may have got their, um, that certain strain of COVID from. And the prime example was just the, MIQ, the, the Auckland student who contracted the same virus as the MIQ um, defence person. And they determined that using whole genome sequencing. And so we can use the same sort of techniques with whole genome sequencing um, to actually look at the spread of gonorrhea across Aotearoa and also other sexually transmitted infections and use this with actual data from people about what drives infection and what's causing this, um, this increase in infections that we're seeing in our communities. And so our research is kind of down the more fundamental end of the scale, but hopefully we can um, contribute to kind of addressing these sexual health inequities. And to do this, we have, um, we have funding from the Health Research Council the Waikato Medical Research Foundation locally, the Morris Wilkins Centre, and this allows us too to establish collaborations as a biochemist and molecular biologist with sexual health clinicians and Māori um, sexual and, um, health and research services such as Te Whariki Takapo as well. So hopefully next time I might be able to actually report on something that we've actually designed some of those chemicals to, to bind in those enzymes, and we might have tested them in the lab by that point as well. So thanks very much for listening. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. So our last panelist tonight is Professor Ross Lawrenson. Uh, professor Lawrenson is Professor of Population Health, and he divides his time between the University of Waikato and Waikato District Health Board, where he is Chair of the DHB Research Advisory Committee and President of the Waikato Postgraduate Medical Incorporated Society. He's also a Pharmac Board Member and is active in health services related to cancer, diabetes, and chronic conditions. Professor Lawrenson. Thank you very much, Bryony. Um, yes, so the lucky last. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I really just wanted to talk to you um, about... Uh, here we are. That's, uh, 
There was one in four <laughs> buttons to go to. <laughs> um, I really just want to talk to you about some of the research that we've been doing in the four years since our team uh, moved across to the University of Waikato. Um, our overview and vision really was that we need to facilitate uh, improved health outcomes in our region through clinical research. And I think there's a lot of evidence um, that organisations that are research active are also have better health outcomes for their patients. Um, and as part of that, we really wanted to complement the work that our excellent health partners, both in primary care but particularly in the, in the hospital sector, have been doing um, and providing support through the university um, for the work that they do. Um, so our intent was to help those busy clinicians answer some of the research questions that are important to them. So to do that, we've had a, a really great team that have come across and we've built up over the last four years um, of basic scientists mixed with um, clinicians who are being honorary members of the university who are working in clinical practice but are really interested in supporting our research. Um, and you know, I would note that you know, there's a range of um, expertise that we need in order to do that research, uh, including qualitative researchers, biostatistics, health economics, um, basic sciences, as Joe was talking about, um, health psychology, um, and health services research. Um, we have been building up our international links, both with uh, the UK, around our cancer research, uh, with colleagues in uh, Australia, um, uh, Sanjeeva uh, Senevaratne in uh, Colombo, who was a PhD student here. Um, and, uh, of course, we've still got our colleagues in, uh, in Auckland and Otago that we work closely with. Um, the areas that we work in are the areas that are really important to the, the health board and, and to our local communities. So, number one uh, cause of mortality and morbidity is heart disease. So, we've been really lucky to attract um, Professor Adam El-Gamal, um, as an honorary professor here. Adam uh, was um, uh, head of cardiac surgery at King's College in London uh, and came to the Waikato over 10 years ago now and has really built up a, a unit that is um, only second to Auckland at the moment in size, of, in size and capacity um, and is growing rapidly in the expertise that they're doing. Um, and Alan is particularly an expert in, in valvular disease which given our, our rates of rheumatic fever is absolutely crucial. Um, the other area, as Bryony mentioned, that I've been interested in has been diabetes. I've been working in diabetes research for uh, more than 30 years now. Um, and that started off here in the, in the Waikato with the um, Waikato Regional Diabetes Service. Um, there's more than 25,000 patients in the Waikato who have diabetes um, and are looked after by the service. Um, and so the research that they do has been really groundbreaking within New Zealand. We're very lucky to now, um, the lead researcher there is uh, Dr. Ryan Paul, who's just got a Foxley Fellowship through the university uh, and the HRC, and he's been working with uh, Dr. Lynn Chepulis, um, who was on TV yesterday with some of her research that um, uh, Moana um, kindly mentioned. Um, we're also working very closely with um, Jade Tamatia, um, who is a Māori researcher and endocrinologist at the DHB um, because, as we all know, the, the um, uh, type 2 diabetes in particular particularly affects Māori. Um, and we've recently just put in a, another HRC bed in conjunction with colleagues from the University of Auckland and University of Otago. Another project that I'm very um, proud of and has been a fascinating project to be involved in has been our HRC lung cancer project, which is coming to its end now. Um, on the bottom right there, we have the wonderful Shimana Kasim, who's been our project manager there. Um, and that was really based around the fact that in the Midland region, we have a lung cancer register that has been recording the problems of lung cancer for more than 10 years now. Um, and my colleagues um, in the respiratory departments came and said, what we need to do is something about earlier diagnosis, and particularly a earlier diagnosis for Māori. Um, and, and so I had a chat with my colleague who was at the time at the University of Auckland, Jackie Kidd, who is a qualitative Māori researcher, and she said, Ross, what we need is a, a Kaupapa Māori co-design project. So I said, um, yes, Jackie, whatever you say, Jackie. Um, and away we went. And we've been uh, engaging with rural Māori communities um, um, throughout the Midland region 
been uh, you know a real joy to work with with Jackie. Um, we've had great support from um, Brendan Hockerfitu and Māori Indigenous Studies here. Uh, Dr. Anna Rolston from the Bay of Plenty and Dr. Ravati Keenan have, have led this um, Kopapa Māori um, co-design process where we've been listening to the stories of Māori uh, patients around cancer and lung cancer and then helping them design interventions um, that were suitable for their communities. Um, and some of those publications are, have been coming out recently. The other area that we've been working has been in breast cancer. Um, Waikato was the um, pilot area for the breast cancer pilot back in the 1990s um, and at that time we attracted Professor uh, Ian Campbell who is the leading breast surgeon in the country. Yeah, Ian set up the um, breast cancer register here in the Waikato um, and out of that register we've had a number of PhD students. Um, we had a big HRC um, project grant um, and now um, Dr Chinwan Lau is got a, um, a breast cancer fellowship uh, working on metastatic breast cancer with Professor Campbell and uh, that work is ongoing and it's, it's been very productive. We're also interested in bowel cancer, there's a real theme here, um, but these are the big causes of um, um, morbidity and mortality in New Zealand. Um, here again we've been working um, with our local clinicians, uh, particularly Ralph Van Dalen and Judy um, Warren who are the lead clinicians here at Waigato, but involving um, on the left there, I'm sure lots of people um, know Chris Jackson, who um, I was involved with his Piper study um, on uh, uh, bowel cancer. Um, and that project has uh, carried on um, providing um, some really important information about access for services um, for patients with bowel cancer. Um, Tania Blackmore there has been our research fellow on that and Tania has uh, recently just got an HRC activation grant to look at some of the work that we've done previously around prostate cancer. Um, that project or that work around prostate cancer again I think we've done some of the most uh, important health services research um, around prostate cancer um, in New Zealand. We did that about eight or nine years ago and uh, Tiffany Schwartz has very kindly come along tonight. Uh, Michael Holmes were very much leading um, the, the need for that research. Michael's doing a lot of work now on MRI and some leading work on the use of MRI for diagnosing prostate cancer. Um, but we've also been doing work um, with um, Richard Egan from um, Otago and Jackie again looking at the supportive care needs for Māori men with prostate cancer which was something that we identified was a real gap. Other opportunities for us to work together, uh, there's the Midland Trauma System, I'm an advisor on the um, research uh, uh, advisory group to this trauma system. Um, Associate Professor Grant Christie from the University of Auckland has the, the best data on trauma in New Zealand from, it's been collecting data from right across the region for the last 10 years. Um, and uh, his work has really improved our outcomes from trauma uh, uh, in New Zealand um, and certainly is uh, saving a lot of money. One of my passions is around rural health um, and very lucky to be working with um, Associate Professor Gary Nixon on an HRC project defining what we mean by rural, um, which is, has always been a challenge. Um, very lucky to have uh, Jesse Whitehead there in the middle um, who's just finished his PhD and is a geographer um, and has been doing a wonderful job um, helping us map all of the data um, to help us define rurality. My colleague Matthew Parsons and I set up the Institute of Healthy Aging uh, at the Waikato DHB about 10 or 12 years ago. So it's a great joy to have Matthew um, come with Tony into the, um, uh, uh, the university. Um, Aging uh, population is the big tsunami that is uh, facing the health services at the moment. We're going to have a 70% increase um, in the aged population by 2030 um, and the, the health demand that that creates for the health service is crucial. So Matthew's work on uh, maintaining people out of hospital um, and uh, in the community is actually a crucial part of that. I think the other area that we should probably talk about is health technology. We are a leading centre for that. We've got Dr Ruth Large there is um, a, a ED clinician at Waikato Hospital, um, but she's also um, the national clinical advisor on telehealth to the ministry uh, and is really passionate about the use of telemedicine. Um, and below there we have um, 
uh, Associate Professor Amanda Oakley, who um, uh, the Waikato may not you may not know this, but is the center world center for teledermatology, um, and Amanda and uh, Maris Rademacher set that up, um, and now um, you don't go and see your doctor to have your um, skin lesions diagnosed, you have a photograph taken in the clinic and then it gets sent to a radiologist and Amanda and her colleagues are, are reporting on um, lesions from all over the world with her teledermatology service. So that's just a brief view of some of the key things that we're doing at the moment. Um, from our point of view, health is absolutely crucial to this region. Uh, we have something like 40,000 health workers in the region. Um, we get over three billion dollars a year comes into the health services. So the university really should be in the business of adding value to that business, um, both um, from the point of view of training and um, uh, expertise, but also uh, the work that we do on research. We have um, the highest proportion and the highest numbers of Māori in the, in the country, in our region, um, and 50% of our population are rural. Um, so there's real opportunities for um, doing research uh, in the health delivery space around equity um, and that's something that we've been doing um, on a regular basis. So our work has been focusing on the things that really matter to the health services. Um, we uh, have been really enjoying working with our colleagues and, and that's really where we see the opportunities going forward. So thank you very much. So we have some time now for audience questions, which have been coming in throughout the evening. Um, there's a few very specific questions here, which I might leave go if, to have, if we have time. And I'll start with some of the more general questions. And this one is a, I'm gonna pick this one because it appeals to my particular biases as well. Um, in a world that's trending away from fact, which is indeed the case, I think, you know, like anti-vaxxers, COVID deniers, etc. How do you plan promoting an evidence-based healthcare mindset and treatment methods? And I think there's probably an answer there from each of you. So what do we do in a post-truth, post-COVID world? Any one of you, just dive on in. <laughs> I, I think it's been really interesting around cancer. It's, um, Chris Jackson spent 10 years trying to convince people with evidence that we should be doing something about various cancers. Um, and then he decided that the politicians actually don't listen to science and evidence, what well, they want are stories. Um, and so we had a, a cancer um, meeting uh, 18 months ago where we brought along Blair Vining who was dying from bowel cancer and he stood up and his wife told of the experience they'd had in the health services and out of that we got a cancer agency. We had the Minister of Health and the Director General of Health there um, and 400 people. And it was the power of the story rather than the power of the graph that I think has changed mind. So I think we have to use both. I think we have to have the evidence, but I think we need to actually get the stories uh, behind that evidence in mm. order to change um, the way we think about things. Yeah, I would say there are different concepts and understandings of what constitutes evidence. Uh, it reminds me, uh, years and years ago, Michael Marmot, so Michael Marmot, who's known worldwide for his leadership uh, in the social determinants of health and uh, chaired a, a World Health Organization commission on that topic. Before he did that, he chaired a commission for the UK government looking at the relationship between alcohol and health. And, uh, and they brought uh, this commission made a number of recommendations to the British government and then he was rather dismayed to find that, that uh, these recommendations weren't actually just fully implemented. Um, and that led to him publishing a paper in the British Medical Journal called Policy-Based Evidence or Evidence-Based Policy. <laughs> um, and, he, and he came to understand that, of course, uh, government has to take into account all other kinds of evidence, not just the scientific evidence that his commission was based on. So I think... I mean, it's, it's really adding to what Ross has said, that it's understanding uh, people's different perceptions and perspectives and connecting with them and finding a way of connecting for them to them, then uh, better understand uh, w what we do know and what we don't know about whatever the topic might be. Mm, yep. Any of us that you'd like to comment on that? I 
think part of it too is maybe like I find for like the next generation of so for, I teach first year university students and training training people to think critically about the information in front of them mm. and where your information is from and so hopefully if we can if we can help you know, if we can encourage them to think about where they're getting their information from and to think critically about the information in front of you, not just because it's on Facebook, it's true, um, then hopefully you know, that spreads into them talking to their peers and their family and whanau and stuff as well. So what we do with teaching and teaching and how we teach our students to analyse what's in front of them also, I think, helps to, to kind of um, contribute to analysing or evaluating the source of the information, I think, is a big one. Yeah, yeah. Well, Karamoana, you commented particularly on, on some of the COVID-related aspects of the community, and, and I guess there was quite a lot there about connecting evidence in a way that just made sense to people. So, so do you have a particular view on, on how we might go about that for, for rural and Maori communities? I think the, one of the important things um, is that there is, you know, you're collecting the stories um, mm. and that you're listening to those stories, uh, that you're listening to the perspectives um, and because there's a lot of evidence to show that, you know, for example, that inequities exist mm. um, and that policies and practices and structures need to change and there's a lot of evidence for that. Um, and so on the one hand, there's a lot of evidence for things and, but things aren't happening. Um, and so if you are looking for a truth or a, a way of um, you know, educating the public, that you're doing that in a respectful way that ensures that what's being collected does get used in a way that's appropriate. So that, that information is, is useful um, and it really is about challenging some of those widely held narratives. Mm. You know, like that, it's Ma that Māori are to blame for their own situation or that racism doesn't exist. So that there's a, always a counter narrative, and that we're working towards building that counter narrative. Yeah, mm. yeah. I was, I was quite taken, Tony, with your um, example about the tasers and the police. That was a situation where you were able to look at their their statistics and, and show that there was this situation where they were two and a half more times like more likely to use the taser in a mental health emergency situation. Um, I mean, well done on getting the police to listen to you and, and do something about that. So, so is, is there, I, I suspect there are sort of the same sort of myths that sit around mental health all over the place. Uh, is, is there something particular about how we tell those stories that would be useful? Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I guess, um, Brian, there are. Um, um, I, I kind of feel maybe I'm going to stray off point here, but um, um, <clears throat> I've been in mental health nursing for a long time, as your opening slide um, <laughs> mentioned. Um, and <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things that um, I'm very aware of is we had a big inquiry into mental health and, and addiction um, <clears throat> in New Zealand and uh, run by the government in 2018, to Oranga. <clears throat> very um, comprehensive kind of investigation, took a very long time was very traumatic actually for the um, investigation team mm. because of the intensity of the stories that they listened to um, <clears throat> that people came forward with. And then of course they were charged with the responsibility of doing something with all of that. Um, <clears throat> not just um, in terms of how they processed it and how they dealt with the, the kind of um, experience of hearing all of that. Um, but um, what sort of recommendations would they make? But what struck me about that inquiry is that um, uh, 20 years ago we had a similar inquiry um, <clears throat> to, um, 1996 and that was into mental health services. Quite a different focus actually but it was a big report that drove um, some significant developments um, within mental health. One was the establishment of the Mental Health Commission in 1998. Um, and from a nursing perspective, um, there was a lot of investment after that report into um, uh, um, uh, postgraduate education for, um, for mental health nurses. Prior to that, there'd been none, and um, not long before that, um, nursing had moved out of the 
hospital-based programs, so there was a kind of loss of specialty focus. But the difference in the focus of mental health, how mental health is thought about, um, was quite dramatic over that 22-year period. So 1996, it's all about mental health services. Um, <clears throat> it did lead to the Mental Health Commission, which um, uh, opened up the kind of discussion about how do we think about mental health, mental illness, mental disorder. Um, and in particular, the kind of development of the recovery approach, or at least the, the not the development that was already there, but bringing it into kind of mainstream um, thinking around mental health. The, the last report, 2018, was into mental health and addiction in New Zealand, not services. And um, <clears throat> uh, that looked at mental health and addiction across the community in healthcare, obviously, and mental health specialists, addiction services, that kind of thing. But it wasn't quite so, it wasn't nearly as focused. So we are thinking much more broadly about um, mental health now than we were 20 years ago. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I think there's something around um, when we think about people's perceptions of. Um, illness, of um, health services, of um, <coughs> um, uh, what's provided and people's perception of where the gaps are, that kind of thing. Um, if we're going to offer interventions, whether they're mental health, addiction or vaccinations, that kind of thing, um, we have to be engaged with the community around um, <coughs> what are we doing it for and what are the um, community um, goals that we're trying to achieve, and people have to be able to identify with those, which they won't do if they're simply handed to them. So that's, I'm sorry, a kind of roundabout way of um, talking about um, kind of shared um, ideas around what we're trying to achieve in healthcare. And um, yeah, I, I do agree that um, with the comment I figured he made it um, about um, people opting for you know a kind of a radical narrative that seems to empower them. Um, because they don't identify with the, the, a dominant narrative that might be kind of, um, might, they might feel is kind of thrown at them that they don't have any um, opportunity to dispute or discuss or engage with. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah fair enough. Um, so, so this next question is an interesting one because if what we hear there from each of you in, in your own way, we're saying you get people to engage with the evidence by getting them to engage with the story behind the evidence, which is a very human-centered way of looking at this. So this next question turns that around a little bit. How are we going to incorporate artificial intelligence into healthcare in New Zealand? And, and you can see where big data sets are going to have a massive impact in, in the hard sciences and now in the social sciences. So, so what are your views on the role of artificial intelligence and ultimately machine learning in, in healthcare provision? We'll start at this end this time and go that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I see uh, any kind of use of, of computers and, and uh, uh, artificial intel intelligence, machine learning, et, et cetera, as, as powerful tools that, that can uh, be used uh, to enhance the quality, the effectiveness of, of healthcare that's provided. They can also be, uh, become a kind of uh, a, a smokescreen or a substitute or, or, um, and, and in the, whether intended or not, in the process dehumanise uh, the, the experience of people who have health problems and maybe present as patients or clients of healthcare providers if what they get is, is a screen and, and uh, you know, respond to a whole lot of questions and eventually uh, you know, the screen talks to them or tells them uh, there might even be an artificial face on the screen. Um, you know, that's, that's lacking the, the, the sense of, of human contact and the recognition of humanity. So uh, one uh, organisation I was involved with in, in Canada, um, the, you know, the, the theme that they were pursuing was compassion in a technological world. So getting the balance between the importance of that human connection and understanding and, 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 and uh, helping people as human beings uh, w with, their, with their lives and their health problems and, and pursuing uh, well-being at the same time as using the technology as, as powerful tools to actually be more successful in, in achieving that well-being. 
I'm going to jump down to you, Ross, because I know that your research has looked at the power of big data sets and, and what we can do with big data sets. Um, so, so where do you see the role of AI sitting in healthcare? Uh, certainly, the opportunities around big data sets are huge, um, you know, and we're beginning to do that. Um, New Zealand has some of the best computerised general practice records. Mm. You know, we have 17 million. GP visits a year, um, you know, so when you've got the power of those data and you can link those to laboratory data, to other data, um, you know, you need AI and the, and the big um, uh, um, data computing to do that. Yeah. But I think, you know, in the area of diagnostics, you know, um, Amanda Oakley's got 300,000 pictures of skin lesions, you know, and she's working with the AI people about, you know, Actually, computers can make a better diagnosis of your skin lesion than a doctor can. Um, so, you know, it's a learning process for the, uh, the computer to learn the different um, lesions that are going on there. Yeah. AI in um, imaging, you know, your MRI and your um, CT scans now, you know, they're not real pictures. They're pictures that the computer have generated from the information that's coming into them. So yeah. AI is already here. It's, um, you know, being um, vastly incorporated in what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and we just need to embrace it and use it without losing the human touch of... You know, if you've got a diagnosis, you still then have to talk to somebody about the implications of that and what that means to you. Mm. Um, yeah. Joe, we were talking earlier about um, PCR sequencing and genome sequencing. The amount of data that we can generate from those now, it, it, is it reliant on artificial intelligence to be useful or is it, is it not that far along yet? I would say it's not that far along yet, but you definitely need massive computing power mm. um, to be able to... Um, to be able to analyse m like massive genome data sets. Yeah. But I think the, one of the biggest problems is data storage yes. so, and data sovereignty and who, you know, like, and um, privacy of that data and stuff as well is a, yeah. is a big issue that I know lots of people here at the University of Waikato are mm. uh, um, grappling with, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Any other comments about the role of AI? Um, yeah, if I could just say, uh, if my colleague Matthew Parsons was here, he'd have quite a bit to say about AI. It's uh, an area of interest for him, and Matthew's also very um, familiar with working with um, big data sets. And so, <clears throat> and he's quite keen for us in the um, uh, in the, the nursing school. I'm calling it the nursing school; it's not the nursing school at the moment. <laughs> um, to to kind of incorporate some of that understanding with, um, within our research programs and in our teaching. Of students, I'm not an AI person, so I won't be part of that. But I'll be a, a kind of um, 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 an enthusiastic kind of learner, I guess. Um, um, yeah. So um, uh, yeah, definitely something that's here, as, as Ross says, and it's for us as um, for those of us who are clinicians um, to learn about what AI can do um, to help us in our work. And then it's for us as clinicians to still do that work of talking to people, um, understanding what they're experiencing and kind of <clears throat> helping them work through what their options are. Yeah. I'm, I'm mindful of time and there's a couple of very short punchy questions here that suggest to me that there's people after specific pieces of information about the nursing program. So I'm just going to jump straight to those. Um, how many students do you expect to enrol in nursing in the first year of the nursing program? Um, for, uh, 40 students, maybe more. M maybe oh, we're, we're no, no more, we're not allowed to enrol anymore. 40. <laughs> uh, well, it depend, depends how you split the Fs. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Yep, so, so, so 40 is the answer to that question. <laughs> um, and, and also, is graduate nursing training for graduates of the nursing school only? Um, most of it is, but the graduate program um, is not just for nurses. So um, some of the, pro um, the programmes... Um, and some of the courses will be multidisciplinary. Fair enough. Um, and a quick question, what is the population of Northern Ontario? Northern Ontario, it's uh, just under 800,000 people. So, would the Northern Ontario model work for a rural providing medical school in this region? Well, in New Zealand, for rural and yes. remote New Zealand, yes. Yeah, cool. Um, 
I, I think I should probably draw a line under it. There, there's, there, there's, there's lots of other, and I apologize if I didn't get to your question, but I'm, I'm mindful of time. It's raining out there and I want everyone to drive safely on the way home. So I, w I will just end, um, opening the floor up back to our wonderful panelists. Is there any last thoughts that you'd like to share on the theme of our, our Kopapa Korero tonight? If not, that's fine too. But if, if, if yes, just jump on in. I'll, I'll say something, Bryony, just to say, um, again, thanks for organising this. Um, and everybody else who's been involved, Amanda did a great job with kind of the, um, <clears throat> getting everything sequenced and being very tolerant of me saying, I'll get you my PowerPoint presentation tomorrow. I didn't mean this tomorrow, I mean the next one. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I worked at the University of Auckland for 20 years. We never did anything like this. I never did anything like this in, in the whole time that I was there. So, you know, I think it's great to be able to have this. So I like being able to have this opportunity to say, this is what I'm about, what do you want to say about that, or, you know, um, be here to kind of um, engage with, uh, with the community. So, yeah, I think it's a great, um, uh, a great event also to actually hear some of my colleagues talking about their work. Unfortunately, um, one of the problems in the university is you're kind of head down doing it and not really talking to your colleagues about what they're doing. Yeah. One of the great delights of my role as Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research is I get to stick my nose in anywhere I like and organise yes. things like this. So I get a really easy job and I get to speak to wonderful people like you. So thank you all very much. Are there any last thoughts from anyone else? Well, I would just echo what, what's been said, pick up what uh, Jo said at the beginning of her presentation. Um, you know, it's, it is, as Tony said, not that common at the moment uh, for, for those of us in in, uh, in health research and the universities really to, to present to a, a mixed audience actually what we do. And I think that that's, you know, back to that first question about evidence and so on, the more that there is that, that opportunity to share uh, the work that we do and, and, and interact with people who have an interest or would like to develop an interest, and the, the, I think the better for all of us really. So I, I certainly encourage this to be a continuing uh, series of events for University of Waikato. Funny you should say that. <laughs> so so to, to wind up with tonight, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming and thank you for your thoughtful questions. Um, and, and if you want to collar them on the way out, you know, just, just do that because they're not off the stage yet. Um, and I'd, I'd invite you all to, to follow the University of Waikato on Eventbrite and Facebook, apparently, um, which is social media, so I don't know anything about it, um, for an update on our next public lecture. Now, the Kopapa Korero series, this is the, the last talk for, for this year in this particular series, but it will be starting in 2021 with an extensive series of Kopapa Korero. And, and, and thank you for the, for the comments. I think this is exactly what the university needs to do to engage with people who are interested and to share what we're doing, which is so um, impactful and world-changing. So thank you all very much to our panelists for your insights tonight. I personally find it absolutely, I could have sat there all night and listened to you, so thank you very much. And um, I'd like to invite you all to join me in thanking them again. Hold my time.